Hi, everybody, and welcome to Under the Forelock. Um, today, I'm very excited to have Suz Crichton Stewart on the show. So Suz has a very unique uh, approach to training and writing. She has a business called A Holistic Solution, which is what you might think. She's really looking at horse training and riding from a holistic standpoint, integrating body work and classical training together. So Suz is a qualified, I'm gonna read off all the qualifications here. She's a qualified equine touch, cranial sacral therapy, uh, equine my myofascial release, uh, and Reiki, and you are also a certified trainer and instructor from the Foundation of Equestrian Arts. So welcome Suz to the show. Hi. Yeah. So we went through a lot of qualifications, but I think what was really fascinating for me was there were two things. One was the story that you really kind of got into body work that was inspired by some challenges you had with your own, uh, with your own horses, um, particularly your um, Icelandic horse that you had. Yeah. Uh, but then as you were doing, and that was your, you know, career, what you were doing, right, professionally, but then you were seeing that, you know, people are coming in again and again, and there's training, and wouldn't it be great to integrate the training with that kind of to, to bring it full circle? Is, is that, that to me was interesting, because I, I don't know about in the UK, but in the States, um, you know, you've got your trainer, and you have your equine body workers, and you might have three or four of them, right, but we don't, and, and sometimes they talk and work together, and other times they don't, so um, is this a relatively new concept for you, or, um, yeah? <clears throat> I first went and saw Manolo Mendez a couple of years ago, mm. Mm -hmm. and, like, I'd been working towards, much like the, how modern physiotherapists do for people, like, human pain and movement science is about 50 years ahead of equestrian science, mm. and so I've been looking a lot at how physios work, and thinking, like, this, you know, they do the movement, and they do the remedial exercises, and they do the soft tissue work, and then I went to see Manolo Mendes' work, I was like, oh, well, if it's okay for him, because he does body work, and he does energy work, and he does training work, and he just blends it all together in a, a just a beautiful, beautiful synergy, I was like, you know, people to aspire to be like, we'll just stick him up there, and work our way up there, hopefully. Nice, nice. And it's been more than a decade in the making, though, having this kind of combination of things and it's kind of unusual here in the UK as well yeah yeah not, not so bad. you know you t you mentioned Manolo um and didn't um if I recall correctly um Manolo did work he he works with um is it I want to say an uh like an osteopathic veterinarian or he's he, he collaborates very, with a lot of different yeah, folks Dr. Kerry Ridgway he mm -hmm. two of them work together really closely and influence yeah. others work a lot and actually I've I missed out on the opportunity to work with Dr. Ridgway, but he trained up a fantastic vet called Dr. Julianne Vass. And mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to study the acupressure with her because I, in the UK, you can't use acupuncture if you're not a vet. Right. So I've learned acupressure from her as well, which is nice. Just nice. And so that's got you started on your journey to, to do that yourself. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Ugh, my problem is I'm an insatiably curious person. <laughs> and every time I see a new way of approaching the body, I'm always like, well, is that, does that fit with me? I should probably go on a weekend and find out. And then, and then most things are like, yeah, I could totally integrate that. You know, there's, there's so many different ways that horses present with, they're like locks, aren't they? They need a different key for everything. So being able to have as many tools as possible just gives me a better chance of either being the person who can help the horse to comfort or knowing the person who can help the horse help me to get the horse to comfort. Nice, nice. Yeah. And so in the training bit, like, so how, you know, talk a little bit about the integration of that, right? So you're, you're working with a horse and maybe they're, oh, I'm not feeling good here. Or I'm moving kind of funny there. Um, so are you doing, is it that the, you're doing the body work as you're doing the training or is it I'm doing the training and I'm seeing something and I do the body work or vice versa? Like how, how do those two inform each other? Because it's an unusual approach. Most of my clients start with me either as body work clients or as training clients. Gotcha. And pretty quickly, as soon as they've got the hang of me, I'm like, yeah, so this is what we're going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> all together but when you when you look at the science behind it you know that fire wire and seal thing that you hear mm -hmm. in neuroscience yeah this makes so much sense if i've spent the time you know my hands are attached to a kind of puny body 
And when I'm faced with a 16 hand horse that weighs, I don't know, 10 times more than I do, there's no way that any amount of pushing and pummeling is actually causing muscles to release. Mm. What it's causing is a window of time where the nervous system feels safe enough that it could allow things to be released. Gotcha. And so if you then can inform the nervous system by using some in hand work or some touch based movement stuff to help them realize that there's this whole greater access to movement that they've now got, then it gets wired into the brain and it gets sealed in and they, then that becomes part of their, we call like a movement map. So the movements mm. that the body knows it can do safely. And then they're more comfortable as you're doing more well, and, 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 feel, and it's a mental comfort as well, right? Because they're not hurting or. There is only mental comfort. So Got we it. used to okay. think, uh, sorry, now I'm going to pain science geek you all out. Um, all right. <laughs> I love pain science. So we used to think that pain caused damage. And that was because, you know, we would scan a damaged joint, you know, or a joint where there was pain. And we would see that there were bits where cartilage was torn and bones were grinding on bones and all those horrible things they used to tell us. But now that scanning is cheaper, they often scan in research studies like both knees of people presenting with unilateral knee pain and discover that both knees look like a complete car crash. Mm. But one of them hurts. So there is a new definition of pain, which is that, and I'm going to have to get my words right now. You have to bear with me because it's kind of late in the UK. Uh, pain is the sensation, which is the perception of threat of damage to the body. So not things are being damaged currently, but there is a risk that things might be being damaged. Okay. And okay. that's like, that's a massive difference. It means that the nervous system can reduce power or reduce flexibility or reduce mobility in a joint just because it feels that it might not be safe. And if through using the body work, you can relax the system to a point where it can then try something new without getting to that threat level, mm -hmm. then suddenly you can have like 30% power increase. You know, that whole thing about like a weak hind leg. Yes. Yes. It, yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that the muscles are smaller. You know, there are rare instances where the muscles are smaller, where there has been wastage due to trauma, mm -hmm. but, quite often it's just simply that the brain doesn't feel that it is safe to use those joints and therefore it limits the power output of the muscles. And if you can help the brain to feel safe about it, then suddenly that 30% power, it just magically comes back like in the course of half an hour's therapy. So the pain is really kind of a protection mechanism, right? And yeah. so then, so, okay. And I can understand the part about we're slowing it down, right? You know, to, so we won't create injury, but, there's not sometimes actual injuries. So, so how does that situation get, is it like, is it, is it something where, you know, you, maybe you've tweaked, you know, the horse maybe has tweaked something one time, right? Because we were running down the hill funny or something. And I was like, Oh, and, but then it creates a situation where now I'm really protective. I've had that pain and now I'm protective all the time of it. Is that, is that kind of a scenario that you see a lot? <laughs> The classic example is if you've ever sprained your ankle. Okay. Um, and for me, the new classic example is if you've ever developed a dental problem during COVID and couldn't go and see the dentist. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was me. Okay. And <laughs> six months of dental pain, but finally got my teeth sorted. And then I had to reteach myself that it was okay to swish your mouth with cold water once you brush your teeth. Because you oh. go to do it and your brain says, stop, there is real danger of real pain here. And like, it took me a week of very gently saying, it's okay. You, like, we're going to slow this down. We're going to very gently swoosh the mouth with water and it's going to be okay to then relearn. And now I do it without even thinking again. So it's okay. precisely, it is exactly that, you know, you might tweak yourself once in the field or say you're jumping as the rider, you might catch the horse in the mouth once because you're off balance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there is yeah. Then that, that perceived risk of pain, the perceived risk of damage. Okay. That and depending, and depending on that, how many, how frequently it happens or so, so, cause I can imagine, and I mean, yeah, I could definitely see get banged hard in the mouth one time or I ran down the hill and went, Oh, and you know, that's because I, you know, and we do that, we tweak our back or whatever. And we're like, mm, you know, you're kind of doing the granny thing for a little bit, but then there's, um, is there another scenario where maybe the horse is being asked to move in a certain way that's slightly uncomfortable, right? Slightly tweaking, but it's over a long period of time that there begins to be guarding as well, right? This so, is a whole other can of worms, yeah. This is why okay. I delve so deeply into the classical training. And um, the, the particular kind of classical training that I've learned, I mean, you've interviewed other people from the Federation, but mm -hmm. Federation? 
foundation. Good the foundation for equestrian um, arts. <laughs> Federation sounds good too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that it's a kind of work with the horses where you stay as much as possible beneath the point at which they brace. It's all about the harmony and the following and the flow. Yeah. So most riding that is taught competitively often does not follow that principle you know never exceed the resistance of the horse is a great classical principle but it depends entirely on what you start as counting as the resistance if your resistance mm -hmm. point is the point at which the horse bucks that's very different from the trainer for whom the resistance point is where the horse holds their breath just yeah. or even where the horse just stops i've run out of hand space on zoom uh, where your hand <laughs> moving into the space that you provide and that's the level that i'm working at okay so, okay if the horse is permanently being asked to do something that it's not quite comfortable with either confidence wise, mental confidence, physical confidence, then that, that creates that continual sense of threat to the, mm -hmm. to the stability of the joints. And ultimately the brain's main concern is the stability of the spine. Mm -hmm. So if there's permanently slight threat to the stability of the spine, because the horse is being asked to do things that it doesn't feel capable for, or being asked to do them in a way that promotes tension mm -hmm. and yeah that that leads to pain the body says look you're not you're not not doing the thing that i'm telling you is dangerous so here have some pain so that you resist even harder Got and it. that it's like a vicious cycle that goes up and up and up so it's wonderful when you get a horse in that you can relax the nervous system through some body work help with the emotional trauma because i maintain that horses suffer emotional trauma through some energy work and just some some compassionate time spending with a horse listening to listening is a funny word things we don't talk the same language but if you hold space for them to just say no about things and then bring in the training as well where they learn that you can actually move together in harmony then pain vanishes basically. now yeah because they because I, I could see situations um so, you know, where, you know, say a horse isn't, and I think this is where the education of the rider comes in and, and where you're doing the classical training is, you know, maybe the, the, the rider is sitting unbalanced or, you know, the rider has a bit of fear um, cause let's all be honest, right. You know, we all ride, with, you know, maybe we got, you know, bucked off in the field or, you know, there was a crow hop or whatever. So, I mean, you, you hear people talk a lot about, uh, fear in riding, right? And getting confidence and things like that. So I think as people too, we end up doing some weird things in our bodies, then then that tension translates to the horse as well, right? So, yes. you know, it, and it's one not a conscious things, thing, right? That your rider is doing. Yeah. So one of the things we didn't mention because I haven't quite finished my qualification yet, but mm. hopefully by the end of August, I will also be a confidence coach. Oh, nice. Because in my pursuit for helping the horses find softness, you know, I trained to help the riders ride better. And then I discovered that one of the discovered is a big word. I noticed that one of the leading causes of tension in the rider is a lack of confidence or fear. Yeah. So I then went out and I found some confidence coaching from a fantastic woman called Kathy Syrett, uh, in order to help me to help my riders better. Yeah. Um, and I have great empathy with them because I'm a really nervous rider. You know, I'm out there doing it professionally, but there's a lot of a lot of planning and managing of my own mind that goes into that so that I can approach the horse in a state where I'm like, okay, I feel comfortable doing this. I can be soft in my body so then I can help you find softness in yours. So now was this, so then when you, you know, you, cause you talked about on the website, um, you know, you kind of had made this discovery working with your clients, but was there also an epiphany with yourself, right? Uh -huh. In your own writing and your own horses, or did that, you know, and, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you know, it's how sometimes, right. We can see it in others. This happens all the time, right. You know, I give great advice, but I can't even, I can't follow it. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean, but like you see it in others in your practice, but then you're like, oh my God, I do this, or this is, this is what's happening with me. Uh, no, for me, it came the other way around. I was like, okay. I am really scared of getting on my horse. There are all these things that I feel like I would love to do, or even worse, things that I feel like I ought to be doing. I am not a big fan of the oughts and shoulds and woulds that mm. come into modern, modern culture. Um, and so I went and found help for me just for my riding long before I ever thought I'd ever be a professional rider or trainer. I just thought I was going to be a body worker and that that would be it. And I love that job. But it, like I say, it's just the curiosity and how to help horses better. That's dragged me all the way into people and all sorts of things and further. 
But you know, what's fascinating to me is, okay, so before, you know, you said, oh, hey, I'm just going to be a body worker. And, but you were a really nervous writer and you were going getting help for yourself, right? In order to improve your own horse's well-being, yeah. right? Um, so what, you know, other than the confidence coaching or, or, you know, learning different ways in your writing to be more confident or balanced or whatever, um, did you find that you had to kind of take, you know, pun intended, a holistic approach with, like, with your own body, like, as far as energy work, confidence, uh, physical work, or, you know, yeah. or is it just really a confidence and an education component? I, I really don't think you can separate them out. Gotcha. Like, we are the sum product of our experiences in life. I like to describe them like colored lenses. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I've got quite a graphic brain. So in my head, I can see like slots into your head, all of these little lenses that come from all the experiences you've had that, I mean, we use that language, they color the way that we see things. So for me that, yeah, like little colored lenses and they all slot into place. And then the world comes into your mind through that series of lenses that change the way that you perceive reality. You mm -hmm. can talk to two people who've been through exactly the same experience right next to each other and they perceive different slights, different great things, different things that they were sad about, just based on what's happened to them through their lives. But then equally, what we then try and portray out of ourselves comes back out through those lenses. So not only am I a horse trainer, I'm also a mom. I can almost say that in American accent now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got these two small kids and I've been applying the same principles of compassion to my horse training as I do to what I kind of call like emotionally aware child mm -hmm. raising. Mm -hmm. So trying to say to myself, you know, not god they're being really annoying that could be the horses or the kids um but what is it that is causing them to feel the need to behave that way what is it that they're trying what need are they trying to communicate that is being unmet that's making me feel like they're being really annoying and why is it that i'm perceiving that as being annoying which is a really long-winded and wordy way to think but it does lead to an awful lot more compassion um and compassion i think is basically the thing that is missing in the world the ability to just look at your horse and be like, not think, God, why is he doing that just to annoy me? Why won't he just bend to the left? But think, okay, what are the things that have changed in our environment? What has changed for me? You know, am I bending to the left as well as I could have done? We just changed pastures or I just changed his grain. You know, is there something, because there's something, sorry, I should backtrack. Something as simple as uh, hind gut disturbance can inhibit your horse's ability to bring a hind leg through. Because if they bring the hind legs through further, they have to swing their gut further and their gut is sore because the food is not working for them. So, you know, like for me, you can't not have a holistic approach to it because it's just all so interlinked. If the horse isn't swinging through properly, its saddle doesn't fit the same. You can't sit the same. You get lower back pain. So rather than going to the chiropractor, what you actually need to do is adjust your horse's diet. Interesting. Simple to do that. But I start starting. Yeah. Big topics which are, We oh. start with passion. <laughs> you yeah. just... Yeah, you've got to, you've got to look at everybody's, everybody's motiva motivations behind their behaviors and think of it that way and not take anything personally ever. Yeah, well, the hind gut thing, the food thing that you brought up is very, very interesting. Um, and, you know, and this seems to be kind of a common theme in a lot of the interviews that I do. But, right, you know, I mean, we've all, I'll, I'll take it back to a human perspective um, because, it, it, you know, we, we'll talk about this as people and we'll go, well, oh, yeah, of course, right? So, the hind gut, right? So, you know, kind of a phrase in the States, you know, you ate a bad burrito and, you know, you got grumpy tummy going on, right? And you're riding because maybe you ate that bad burrito an hour before yeah. and you're not feeling so great, right? And your instructor is asking you to, you know, do a vigorous posting trot or, you know, sit up in the two point or yeah. ride a cancer that, you know, I can just tell you that it's not very comfortable, <laughs> but your stomach's not feeling well. And that impedes how you're going to mechanically move, right? You're just not on your game, so to speak, right? And, you know, if I were to say to my trainer or my coach, you know, hey, I'm not feeling good. Like I'm having, my stomach is grumpy. Then they're like, okay, we throttle back, right? But we don't seem to think about that from a horse perspective, right? That the, you know, maybe the hay got changed. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's some gastro things going on there um, that are fairly obvious, but we don't throttle back. We get angry about that, right? We take it personally. We're pushy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's where where part of the, the fine line between ambition and kindness is so hard. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's the same thing as those oughts and woulds and shoulds that I mentioned earlier. There's all of this 
unless unless you are a professional jockey or a professional rider of some sort where your income depends upon you riding most of us are pleasure riders we do this for fun and so the only reason that we feel like we ought or should or would is because of an ambition that we have and i'm not saying that ambition is a bad thing like i'm not sure that the world would move forwards if people didn't have goals that they were working towards but it's it's when people become too fixated on the goal and not fixated enough on the why it is that you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then that's when we, you know, our, our brains play like a, a balance sheet between, well, how close does this get me to doing the thing that I really feel like I ought to do that will validate me or that will make other people praise me or whatever it is. That's your motivation behind the thing that you've got to do and lose sight of the, why it was that you actually wanted to be doing it. And therefore you, you've lost the harmony with the horse. And as soon as you yeah. lose the harmony, then for me, it kind of cheapens the things that I've been there. I've achieved things in ways that I now look back and think, oh God. And there'll still be days even now where I'll, you know, lose my rag and I'll have to think, okay, so the kids woke me up at four. I've had less sleep. I didn't eat breakfast. And then I came and rode and no wonder I'm being a grumpy cow. Like I should just get off my horse and do some in handwork and apologize and come back when I've had a snack, much like yeah. a toddler. I think more of us should treat ourselves like toddlers. It would be <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and, and it's, I've, I've had, um, I've definitely had in my own personal experience where, you know, where you really listen to that gut check, right. And you walk in and, and it's, and it's very evident that today is not going to be a good day. Whatever I had a plan in my head to do is today is not a good day for that particular schooling session or that ride. And I've decided not to ride at all. Right. Um, because, you know, I, my horse has very bad heats and it's obvious she's incredibly uncomfortable. So anything that we do is not going to work. Um, or, you know, hey, let's let's tone it way down or let's, you know, go on a hack and not not school or whatever. But every time I have done that, um, I've gotten so much better afterwards. Right. Like you just it always seems like that next couple of three days, then like amazing things happen, you know, um, versus trying to, quote, push through it. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm, I, I, it's something that I've had to learn over time, uh, that it's, you know, slow is fast, right? You know, slow is fast. Yeah. Very, very definitely. And it's, I guess it's a bit like having a demanding boss. If you've got a boss that you can go to and say, listen, I understand that we're working towards the quarter end, but actually like for the next three days, I, I ate a dodgy burrito. I am not on top form. I'm just going to shuffle the paperwork and get other things in place and, you know, make sure that my space is clear. And then in three days time, I'm going to be on totally top form. If you had a boss that understood that rather than going, I don't care how you feel, we're just going to do it anyway, because I feel that we should, you know, then you have somebody where that relationship blossoms and you want to work for them. There's this whole thing about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, especially in movement. Mm -hmm. which comes back actually to the safety of what the brain feels it's capable of doing. So it, it, it is all, it's why I'm called a holistic solution. It's just one giant circle of knowledge. It's yeah. It's, it's all interconnected. Yeah. It is. But when the horse feels motivated to move with you because it is fun, because it's something that they feel better when they do and they can have that, the enjoyment of the movements that we all love, you know, like the high school movements, we all love them because the horses do them in the field when they're free or when they're feeling, you know, aroused or excited or anything else. And they look really cool. But our goal as riders is to help the horses engage in those really cool feelings without having to be you know, frightened or excited or anything. And yeah. you can get those one of two ways. You can either get those by extrinsically motivating horse, either with like positive reinforcement or with negative reinforcement, like whichever way you want to go. But it's never as pure or as joyful as when the horse just gives it to you for fun, because it would be really cool to move together. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the real, it's the real gift. And you don't, you don't get it every day, but you know, we're not on our A game every day either. No, and we're not on our A game every minute, which I, which, you know what I mean, which is, is, is kind of funny. Um, and that's okay. That's the other that's thing. That's fine. Yeah. That's okay. Like this whole, the period of time that we're in at the moment where everybody's had to take this great enforced rest in their lives. Well, for those of us who don't work in hospitals, thank goodness for key workers. Um, <laughs> thank you, key workers. Um, but we've had this time to take stock. And then we've had all, like this whole great awakening in terms of race and everything that's going on. I'm not even going to pretend to understand or comprehend. I am learning every day about that. 
but I do feel like one of the things that people are learning is there's this like overarching uh, supremacy culture, which says rush, rush, hurry, hurry, you know, do it right. Don't do it at all. The monsters are coming. They're going to get us. I mean, that's just not actually necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, and something, it's something that um, Marianne, my, my mentor has taught me through the classical work is that, you know, it comes from this great matrilineal matriarchal kind of culture of nurturing and kindness and supporting. And it's really now I'm seeing how little there is nurturing and supporting in like the whole of the rest of our culture. And let's be honest, the whole of our rest of our culture, we live in for 23 hours a day when we're not working with our horse. So it really influences everything we do with our horses. And I'm trying to take my horse time and apply it so much more to all of the rest of my lifetime. Spread that stuff around like glitter. That's kind of where I'm going. Oh yeah. Well, and you bring up a really good point though. I mean, because you know, I, I, you can't turn the light switch on and off. Right. So, so there is, whether you're conscious of it or not conscious, um, you know, having this stuff go on for, you know, 23 hours a day and then you walk in the barn and to think that you're going to be like that is, you know, and I, and I think there's, you know, it's a great point because in some ways you just, you have to forgive yourself. I mean, why, you know, when you put it in that context, right, why would anybody think that was possible? <laughs> right? like, you know what I was saying? We like, we yeah. ought to, and we should, right. we should be able to do that. Uh, yeah. I've always, oh no, for a long time, I used to beat myself up about not meditating because my mentors meditate and I know that it would be good for my practice. And I really, really, really have this burning ambition to be really good at my practice of horsemanship, that is. And then I realized that actually, you know what? I would meditate every day for 20 minutes on the way to the kids' school and back again because I would have to focus my mind on driving a car in a calm fashion with all of this going on in the background. There you go. That, that is meditation. I brought my mind to a central point where I can breathe and focus despite all of the distractions around me. So just because my practice doesn't look like somebody else's practice doesn't mean that I'm not working on the thing. Yeah. And learning that I could build in the things which will help me with my horsemanship to the rest of how I deal with my life suddenly meant that I was, you know, well, I'm awake for like 16 hours a day. I'm a mom. Uh, I was actually working on my horsemanship all that time, even though when the kids were tiny, I might get to ride like three hours a week if I was really lucky. So yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it becomes a way of life for you. The, the horsemanship informs the life and the life informs the horsemanship. Well, and I think, you know, honestly, um, you know, and, and I've said this and, and I've heard other people say it, but, you know, people who don't ride and they ask, you know, oh, and, you know, especially the dressage, what's that? And, and I'm kind of like, you know, you really, I'm just going to say, it, you really have to have your shit together to ride, right? You know, I mean, you can't, so, so it does help, right? Because, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with a very large animal that gets frightened very easily and can, you know, hurt, kill, or, you know, maim you very quickly, um, you, you have to be very like in that moment. And when, if you're not, and every single time I have been distracted, that is when I found myself on the ground, right? You know, uh, and, um, <laughs> it's just, that's just the way it is. Right. So you have to be super present. And I think, um, that super present kind of has bled into, um, you know, other areas of my life, at least I know, um, that it has. Right. Uh, so, you know, and I've even said to myself sometimes, well, you know what, I have had to deal with a panicky 1100 pound animal and going into, you know, this business situation can't possibly be as bad as, you know, as, as, you know, that. So yeah, yeah there's definitely that kind of flow that goes between the two, I think. Right. I do wonder about if I ever try and go into a corporate job, like what would my CV say? Can handle horses and children. Like, throw, there you go. What else can you throw at me? Can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, one question I had for you, you know, as we've been talking, and one of the things I was thinking about was, so, you know, you're working on the horse, and you're working energetically, you're doing, you know, some, some body work with them um, and the training, then how does that inform when you have a rider come in, right? So what kind of process do you put the rider through as far as, you know, is this something that they participate in, um, you know, the, the, the body work and, and, and how that works? Do you work with them or do you recommend they get some body work or, or go to, you know, I know you're doing the confidence coaching, but the, um, you know, I'm thinking more of the physical. <clears throat> I used to work mm. on riders. So okay. the, the, the pathway that I went down to end up where I am was I started out by trying to be an equine behaviorist. 
but I was okay. rubbish at that. I did all the Monty Roberts training. Um, oh, you did? <laughs> I did yeah. Uh, well, except for over here, it's with Kelly Marks. But yeah, I did okay. all of all of that. And I was a rubbish behaviorist because mm. I'm a really good, compassionate, empathic person. So when the horse is high as a kite on adrenaline, so am I. They oh, wow. no grounding rock to bring them back down to earth. But it was fine. Uh, so through that, I discovered the equine body work. And through working on the horses, I noticed that I had one particular client um, who I could poke her in the back in the same places her horse was sore. And every time she would be sore there too. I was like, right, well, it's no good. I'm going to have to go back and train how to work on you guys too, because you are making your horse sore. And if I'm going to make your horse feel better, then I'm going to have to make you feel better too. Um, so yeah, I used to do like horse and rider packages where I'd work on both of you quite often at the yard it's lovely in summer miserable in winter mm. um you know I used to have heated blankets and all sorts for the winter but nowadays I you know I've had to accept that there's that whole what is it jack of all trades master of none yes and I already yeah. have a pretty large wheelhouse of things that I'm trying to cover and that my heart just wasn't in the human movement stuff mm-hmm Mm-hmm. I love the human mind stuff, but for the human movement stuff, I now know some really awesome physios and reflexologists and all kinds of other therapists. I'm like, okay, I think that this is the person you need to go and see. Okay. So, so it is kind of like, so let's say I were to come to you, right. And yeah. you know, you're working with my horse, but then you're like, mm, you know, you really need to go, you know, my feet. I want you trot up when your horse trots up. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. But, but then it's like, okay, so Betsy, we're going to do this, this, and this with your horse, but here's a great physio for you to go to. Cause it seems like you've got some lower back issues that you need to work out. Uh, you know, at the same time as you're working with me. And do you, do you find that most people, when you make those recommendations that they're, they're like, yeah, I'm going to go do that. Or, you know, what happens when you have somebody that's, you're working, working, working with a horse, but then they're not really, you know, doing anything themselves, you know, tricky question. I know. But, no, not really. Yeah. It's interesting by, because I'm a little bit left of center, by the time people have come to me, they've generally had a really crappy time with their horse for a while. Gotcha. Um, yeah. That's why they've wound up on my door because, you know, it's just not getting better with whatever they've been using before. So that A, they're generally quite willing to be like, okay, wh- whatever it is you say, we'll just give it a shot. Gotcha. But equally, equally, I guess I can only ever give recommendations, but because I'm used to dealing with small children, my recommendations are reasonably bluntly put. It will be this is the thing that your horse is sore with. This is how you're sitting on it that is making the horse sore. So if you want it to go away, you'll have to go and do the thing. The choice is yours. Like you want the movement to improve, go do the thing. You can carry on paying me to come out and work on your horse for as long as you like and I'll happily take your money. But I'm telling you now that it'll be pointless because you need to go and fix the thing in yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Play the spade thing. So do you find, so you mentioned that the clients that come to you are kind of, right, it's, it, I wouldn't say last resort, but they've gone through a lot of conventional things, right? Um, yeah. So are you, when, when you say that though, is that, that people, um, how do I put this? It's not like they're coming and it's like catastrophic, right? I mean, it's, no, not it, at all. yeah, it's, it's just kind of it's not quite right. I'm not quite getting there. And I'm trying these things, you know, is it, is it more of that kind of thing or is there a spectrum? I mean, of, of the type of client that comes. I think the trouble is because I, I live my life from a a viewpoint of great introspection, which is how Mm. I've wound up being good at what I do because I look at all of the things that I then demand the same of my students you want to work with me I I mean it says it in my Instagram bio you know if you're ready to dive in and dig deep because for me the great horsemanship it comes from working on yourself it is a kind of self self self-discovery a kind of self what's that word I'm looking for self-improvement yeah yeah so you you've got to be ready and willing to do the work on yourself as well as with your horse because you're not going to find that mindful, quiet stillness while you're riding if your mind is neither full, mindful or quiet or still. So people don't come to me because they want to learn to walk, trot, canter and pop a cross pole. They come to me because they're really ready to do the work with themselves mm-hmm. in partnership with their horse and, you know, make that beautiful connection. Yeah. And, and it does I'm... mean that some people come to me and they last for one lesson and they're like, whoa, that was oh, really intense. That is not for me. And that's fine because I, you know, there are so many horse trainers out there that I'm not going to be the right fit for everybody. But yeah. there are enough people out there like me who are, you know, into 
looking within themselves and seeing what they can draw out and you know what is my greatest potential what is my horse's greatest potential what can we achieve together where we can only find that fire and that magic that that there are people who come to me so do you think that there i you know it's interesting um you know, there's always a debate. It seems like that there's a debate between, you know, um, and you talked about where right, ambition is, is not a bad thing. It's when ambition starts to trump, you know, safety and comfort and your injuring and, and things like that. Um, but like the, uh, um, you know, there seems to be this mutual exclusivity. So if somebody is going to come and work with you, then, well, you're not going to be competitive or you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be, you know, this or that. Or if I want to be competitive, then I wouldn't go work with somebody like says, because that's too, you know, woo woo is kind of the word you hear around here. Uh, But, but it doesn't, it, it, but it seems to me like you can do that together. I mean, you know, do you, do you work with people who are, are like, hey, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a heavy show schedule or I'm going to go do this 100 mile endurance ride or whatever. Uh, or is it, you know, like that? Or do you find that people are still not really figuring out how to integrate that or don't want to integrate that? I don't have many heavily competitive clients mm-hmm. at the moment yet, whatever word you want to use. Um, mm. I would have no, I would be, I'm happy to work with anybody who's ready to look within themselves, I guess. Yeah, but that, yeah. that interestingly, it brings you back to that patriarchal culture thing that mm. and or like things can be either and both. Yeah, for me, so my my burning ambition competitively is to ride 100 miles in a day, despite mm-hmm. the fact that I live and breathe and train classical dressage. I'm actually an endurance rider by trade, but what I really like is to ride a beautifully balanced, harmonious horse where we can breathe for breathe together for 100 miles. Right. Four minutes right. in the show ring is really not long enough when you could ride for five hours, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, but, but that, I, so for me, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be either or. I would much rather achieve my 100 miles through trust and harmony and partnership than through any of the hideous things that you see happening in other parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, cause I would think, um, for a competitor, you want to kind of make, have every competitive edge that you could get. Right. But, but then there are a lot of things that are competitively advised to do that don't feel good in yeah. your gut or in your heart. And if you open yourself up to the level of feel that the way I work requires, then you might realize that some of the things you've done are not things that you're comfortable with. And then you'd have to learn to forgive yourself. And like, it's a whole rabbit hole of self-discovery and self-work which not everyone's willing to do yeah we're raised to think that feelings are scary so many yes. people you know we kids fall over and we tell them that they're okay well, they're clearly not okay they're bleeding and they're crying yeah for me i was always telling i would always tell a kid you're gonna be okay in the future things will be fine but right now i can see that they really suck for you and let's just sit here in this sucky feeling and just acknowledge it and then it will pass and that's okay that emotions come. It, you know, it's the same as we teach our horses. There is a tiger in the hedge. We are frightened. And now the tiger is passed and we're all okay. But when we deny our horses or our children or ourselves the right to feel sad or upset or angry or any of the big negative feelings, I don't quite know mm-hmm. why they're negative, then suddenly they become taboo and they become stigmatized. And then we have to hide them. And then suddenly, you know, we have to strap our horse down so that they can't spook, so that we can't feel the fear, so that nobody notices that we might be feeling anything other than smiley and happy all the time. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, it's- It's, it's used by humanity a lot of the time. Uh, well, yeah, I was gonna say, we just don't have to have this conversation about horses, you could have it about, you know, any, any sport, honestly, right? You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. All, it's all of humankind, it's just that we choose the particular amplifier of horses, which mm-hmm. they really, they do, they amplify and they mirror back all of the things going on inside ourselves. And we can either look at them and be like, wow, that is really interesting. I had no idea about that stuff about myself and now I'd like to work on it. Or we can kind of get a glimpse of it and then go, oh shit, no, I don't like that. I'm just gonna shut that back down again. I'm gonna yeah. put on a stronger bit. I'm gonna tie your nose shut tighter. Nobody's gonna know that we are not in harmony and we're just gonna crack on and trot down the center line. Yeah, you're gonna shut that <laughs> box <laughs> and weld it, yeah. Yeah, no, it's... um. 
Yeah, yeah, we probably could talk about hours about about that particular thing. So uh, getting back to the body work, though, so you said, you know, you you had a lot of things that you're qualified in, right? Um, do you find over time that you've been doing this that uh, certain body work is kind of more in fashion or not in fashion? Do you find that the tools in your toolbox you're using uh, more often or, you know, how does that change over time? Because, you know, as you said, there's more learning and, and, and more research being done. Um, does that affect the kind of body work that you're doing now, say, you know, when the start of your career? Well, the equine touch is always my bedrock. It's the thing mm. I know best. It's like my, my grounding. I always start with that. Um, but all the other things, you know, I've generally chased down the path of knowledge because I've had a particular horse that I couldn't help with the tools that I had. So then that thing will be, you know, the favorite thing that I'm working on for a bit. But I make a point of going back through my old notes at least every, you know, year to 18 months. And I'm like, oh, I forgot all about that really cool thing. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go back and I'll, you know, try it out. But the horses, they tend to turn up when I either need to learn something new or I need to remember something I already knew. And so I have to rummage around in the toolkit to find the right thing. Nice, nice. But at what point? let's just say as a body worker. Um, and I think you could make this analogous as a trainer, right? You know, there's, there's people who are like, Oh, and I know how to do this and this. And I studied with this person. And it's like, you know, 18 names and they're all different disciplines and everything else. So is there a point at which you feel like, um, you know, you know, how much is enough or, you know, at some point, right. You know, where, where is that tipping edge of, you know, really being a jack of all trades and master of none, you know, it, that's a really interesting question because I am certain that some of my knowledge chasing in the past has been due to not feeling like I'm enough. Mm, mm -hmm. So I've, you know, it's really easy to study stuff, but not necessarily apply it. Mm, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've definitely been guilty of that in the past, which is probably why I've ended up qualified in quite so many things that I maybe could have, you know, could have achieved in other means. But but there's always something new. There's always, you know, a horse and a rider combo that has interacted in a way that you've never experienced before. And so even if you don't go and study something new, you might have to make something up new that you've right. never used that particular combination or timing or scheduling of skills and bodywork together. So yeah. I, it, it's kind of a twofold answer. I don't think there is ever enough. I think that we are always learning and that's what makes it so fun is when you can be open to the fact that everything is always a work in progress. But at the same time, you have to know yourself well enough to know when you're avoiding simply doing the thing for fear of getting it wrong by just studying more stuff. Yeah. Or, or going to the next one, the next one, right? You know, well, yeah. yeah, especially, <clears throat> especially if you find yourself going to a lot of different trainers and nothing's helping you to have the right effect with your horse. That's the point where you might need to just stop and see what the common denominator between all the horses and all the trainers is. Mm -hmm. And if it's you, then then it's time to go and have lessons with me. Yeah, there you I go. I force you to dig deep <laughs> into your personal issues and work on them until, until it all goes much better. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's a very interesting point because that's, that's another thing that, you know, you talked about sealing up the box with a horse, right. Where, you know, we're going to, we're going to use a, you know, a, we're going to bid up, right. So to speak, or use more tie down or whatever. Um, but I think also don't we do that as a person, right. As a writer, uh, you know, where we say, oh, well, this oh, my internet is failing. Betsy? Hello? Oh, no, I've lost you. Hello? Go on.
Hey. You're back. Hello. That was crazy. Um, and it's still recording. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we'll re we'll restart the so so bas so basically kind of the 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 thing that I was thinking of as I was hearing you talk about like we um, you know we tamp all this stuff down uh, but then you know I think that people do that right because. I'm not going to go deep in this, or I embarrass myself, or I'm afraid, or I don't understand. So I'm going to go find this discipline that's going to be better, right? Or this clinician that's going to be better. Uh, but I think then you're kind of just masking the problem, right? Which is why I think what you were trying to get to when you said, yeah. you know, you really got to look at what the common denominator is. Yes, so, exactly. You yeah. really do. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's scary, and that's uncomfortable. And I'm aware that sometimes I come across as reasonably like hard, not hard faced, but hard hitting at people. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't want people to feel that way, but that actually I'm, I'm right here for people when they are having those scary emotions to say, this is, this is okay. This is a normal part of human existence that we can't feel peaches and cream all the time. That life isn't, it just isn't like that. And that that's fine. But learning to sit with all these uncomfortable emotions is part of what you've got to do. Like whether it's, you know, you trotted up the center line and it went, you know, six foot sideways at X or whether it's the fact that you cooked dinner and it absolutely sucked or you screwed up at work, like whatever it is, being able to just stand up and go, I did that really badly. And that's okay because I learned a few things from that and I'm going to practice it differently and do it another way next time rather than I did that really badly. And therefore I am bad. Mm -hmm. And I can never improve because it is a, a fixed, a fixed thing. I'm currently listening to Dr. Carol Dweck's book mindset, which is like mm -hmm. the original growth versus fixed mindset textbook. Oh, it's not a textbook. It's kind of a popular book, but, and it is so true. Like the number of things in which we say to ourselves, not I have failed and therefore I can do better next time, but I am a failure or I am bad rather than that was a bad experience. It's just, it's mind boggling how much we limit the things that we are capable of simply through the way that we talk to ourselves. And that's because of the way that we were talked to and the way that our parents and our teachers were talked to when they were young. It's just like this perpetuating cycle of negativity. And um, I'm here with the sledgehammer, basically. I'm smashing the cycles. I'm not having it anymore. When we're, yeah. when we're full of love and compassion for ourselves and when we add the word yet to everything, I am not good at cooking yet. I cannot do passage on the horse I trained myself yet. That would be me. Uh, <laughs> even though I'm supposedly a classical trainer. I am a classical trainer. I just haven't trained her to do it yet. And that's fine. And that doesn't mean that I'm a bad trainer or that I'm not a qualified trainer. It just means that I haven't done it yet. And right. it's so freeing. It's terrifying, but it's also freeing at the same time. And I would encourage anybody listening, the next time they say to themselves, oh, you know, I'm so rubbish because I can't, just add those three little letters on the end. I can't yet. And you're like, oh, but maybe tomorrow I will. Maybe in five minutes I will. Yeah, it is interesting because I've had it said, um, you know, I, I think another way that people, uh, you know, what could you do if you, what would you do if you could never fail, you know? And, and that totally changes, you know, the, the, I, I was going through a really rough period on, on something that I was doing and, and I was talking to somebody and he said to me, Betsy, what would happen if you couldn't possibly fail? And it was really strange because then the next day I sat down to this seemingly impossible problem and mm -hmm. broke through it and then did an amazing thing in two hours. Right. So, you know, it's, 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 you're, you're definitely right about that. And I think the other bit though, we could, we take that and extend that to the horse, right? This horse is bad, right? This horse doesn't know how to passage. So it's bad. So I'm going to get another one, right? Or, or, or I'm going to do, you know what I mean? Cause you see that a lot of that, this horse doesn't have the potential. This horse doesn't, right. Cause it can't do it right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and again, so curious, you know, do you, do you see that being transferred on the horse as well? Or that people come in with that ad to like, my horse is bad because it can't do these particular things or like it's a failure because right. You said drifting six, six feet off of X, right? Oh, my horse will never do dressage. Right. I'll never get a 71. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. Well, you know, and it depends how much of your identity you're defining by your ability to get a 71, I guess. Yeah. True that. Yes. Um, yeah. 
Yes, so much. I have this beautiful horse that I was gifted. She's half warm blood, half Irish, God knows what. Should they call her an Irish sports horse? Mm. Um, and she can passage across the field like nobody's business. Her front legs are probably a full three inches shorter than her back legs. Like for her to be able to lift her weight off her front end and get it on her back end is a miracle. Uh, but she can do it. But she won't even trot with me yet because wow. her body does not feel safe trusting a human to influence the way that she's moving in such a way as we are trotting in a relaxed state yet. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, God knows when we're going to get to the other end of that yet. Yeah. She's really <laughs> teaching me patience and all sorts of things about not having ambition with a horse is definitely what I'm learning with her. But I can see it's not that she can't do the movements. Like I see her do them in the field every time I stick out a new bale of hay. She's the boss. Nobody else is allowed to do the hay. Apparently you explain this in Passage as far as she's concerned. Um, <laughs> so it kind of, it brings us back around to that motivation for movement and the horse feeling safe with you. Mm. Mm-hmm. That those are obviously things that she hasn't achieved yet either. And mm. that's sad that the things that have happened to her in the past have led her to that point. But also it, you know, like what an opportunity for growth and for learning for both of us if I can help her realize that humans could be, well, not even humans, actually, she's great with my daughter. If I can help her realize that grownups could be a partner in movement that we could harmonize and move together, like, wow, we will both have learned so much by the time we've got to that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's just, man, it's really fascinating to me because we keep coming back all the time to, it's the same the energy, right? It's the same thing. It's, you know, that the horse isn't feeling fear, which is a mental thing mostly, yeah. right? As you mentioned, right? She can do this just fine, relaxed in the field by herself. Yeah. But when a, when a person is present, then it's like, oh, right. It's that threat levels raised. But actually, I wanted to yeah. go back to something that you said before that your colleague said, what if you could never fail? That's right. Yeah. And how that worked really well for you. But actually, I would feel that's kind of sad. When we stop feeling like failure is a bad thing, Mm. like unless you are a brain surgeon or a rocket scientist, failure is generally not a life or death situation. And so when we can allow ourselves to be vulnerable and to screw up or to just fail at something just because and be like, okay, what am I going to learn from this now? What am I going to take forwards from this experience? Then that's hard and I'm only like, 70% 70% of the way towards getting to where I can do that <laughs> because I'm yeah. really, really human. But it's even, it's even more freeing than the idea that you couldn't fail. Even though the, the thought of not failing at all, is massively freeing. The idea of, well, what if I failed and it wasn't the end of the world and I could just learn things and try again is like, there you go. I'm going to give you homework, Betsy. 2.0. Yeah. Well, well, this worked, this worked for me because it was more of going back to what you were saying. It was, I am a failure because I cannot figure out this problem, right? And he said, well, what if you couldn't fail? Meaning that there's really not a problem here. You just haven't, you're not finished, right? And, you know, so it's, yeah, it was definitely a self-defeatist attitude for sure. Yeah, (laughs) I'll grant you that, you know. But But, look at all the things you learned from that situation. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 And it's funny because I, you know, we talked about life going in, in different directions. Um, you know, I had gone to my very first show ever with my horse, which of course is, you know, there's, that's fraught with like a million things. Forget about yeah. getting a good score. Forget about any of that. Right. So, yeah. uh, but you know, I kind of walked in, there were two things that happened. I walked in with the attitude of, okay, well, what would you do if you couldn't fail? Right. Cause it's not a failure to be there. Yeah. But the second thing was that, you know, for me winning was, okay, I'm going to get there. We're not going to flip out. I'm not going to be on the ground. She's not going to be in the next state. Yeah. And, you know, we're, and we're going to do the test. I mean, I think the only little ambition that I had was I didn't want the bell rung and I'm excused because I goofed up my test. Right. But I had, I had a caller there, so it was fine. So, you know, and then the show ended up going way beyond my expectations in a positive way, which was really, really good, right? But I think, you know, a lot of what you're talking about as far as this whole energy and what you're bringing, right? If I'm 
if I'm in a different place and I'm relaxed, then I'm not doing hinchy weird things with my body, right? You know, and then on top of it, my horse is not a responding to, to the weird stuff I'm doing with my body that's just physically uncomfortable for her, right? Because I'm not balanced, but also mentally, I'm you know, if I'm mentally unbalanced, that you know, there's definitely that feedback loop. I, I, at least I know with my horse, and it's probably true of everybody's horse, but they think they pick that up like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, and then the things start happening, um, with, with, you know, the protections, right? So there's, there's two things that I want to pull out of that. One is I like to believe, and certainly it's true with the horses that I'm working with, that when I approach them with that compassionate sense of, you know, what's causing the behavior, what's the motivation behind it? as they become calmer and more present and more mindful themselves, basically classical dressage is mindfulness for horses. We teach them to bring their minds to a central point that they actually become more compassionate to us. Mm -hmm. Especially I have this, I guess she's still a young horse. She's eight now, but I got her at two and a half Mm -hmm. and she has been my, my massive learning curve horse. She's the first young horse I've ever, you know, done everything myself. So Mm -hmm. all of her faults are entirely things that I have probably taught her to do. But she is so compassionate towards me. I can be having a really bad day. You know, I've not slept enough. I've not eaten properly. You know, things have happened outside of my control and I'm dealing with disappointment or whatever else. And I can take her out for a hack and be completely not present at all. And she will now just very gently and very kindly potter me around the lanes until my head just, you know, hears that four beat of the walk enough times that I come back into myself and I'm like, oh, hello, I'm back. And she's like, oh, brilliant, you're back. Should we have her canter now? nice there's two things nice. there's, yeah there's one that that the horses learn to teach us with the same compassion that we treat them but the other thing is the idea of using the competitions as like a proof like a mathematical proof to ourselves so you can do this with schooling figures at home um mm. but i partic- sorry my phone thinks that i should be going to bed now <laughs> um, <laughs> um so the idea of using competitions as a proof Mm -hmm. so I've taken my mare I think we've probably only been to one dressage show because it's a lot of effort to get somewhere with a grey horse clean and all your kit clean with two small kids they just don't do it very often but I approached it with kind of the same mentality as you were describing that for me a win would be getting into the arena and starting up towards the center line whilst both of us still breathing and nobody freaking out and nobody having pushed past their own threshold of where they felt comfortable or any of those pushing things that I'm trying to avoid doing. And then the actual dressage test itself for me, I approached it with an attitude of, can I maintain the same level of harmony and detachment from outcome, that lack of ambition that we strive for at home? Can I maintain that in a situation where I'm being watched by other people and literally judged by a woman sat in a car at the end? Mm -hmm. Can I uphold my own values in a more stressful social situation? And the answer was almost entirely, which I was pretty pleased with. <laughs> that um, is but awesome. that way, you know, competitions become a really joyful experience of, okay, so only regarding my own opinion of myself, my own values, can I maintain the relationship? Can my horse and I execute the maneuvers without a breakdown in relationship at the points that the test dictates? And how am I going to feel if I canter, you know, three strides past C rather than at C because Mm -hmm. the feel was better in the transition when I got to that point. How am I going to feel in the social construct of being in a competition when I do that? And that brings like a whole nother dimension. That's like mindfulness 2.0. Yeah. I do it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and I think too, you know, beyond uh, dressage, I, I, I think that's an applicable moment, right? Whether you're doing, you know, jumping or, yeah, or you know, even, endurance. even endurance, what you do, right? You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Endurance yeah. is like 3.0 because it's, can I remain mindful of the, the relationship and the connection for four or five hours? For a long time. So it's like a very extended meditation. Yeah, yeah it, it does. And you know what? When you've been trotting for an hour, it really is like a meditation. Up, down, up, down, up, down, boom, 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 boom. You know, listening for any unsoundnesses, listening for any variation in stride, just really focused on what's going on. Or alternatively, you know, riding with a friend and nattering and losing place of the markers and getting lost. That's the other <laughs> non mindful version. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I it's I, I like to, you know, hack out occasionally with folks at the barn and we're we're blessed to have a pretty big, you know, acreage behind us that we can just, 
you know, uh, trot around and, and, you know, go up the, the logging lanes and things like that. But it's the same kind of thing. You know, we both, we get talking and, you know, all of a sudden my horse has just been plonking along, you know, and, you know, I kind of forget and I'm on the buckle and I'm thinking, wow, this is kind of crazy because, you know, I'm more, you know, she's pretty spooky. So you know, for her to just be walking around. Uh, but, but I think also there's that, again, it goes back to the energy component of, you know, you and I are like, let's say we were out and, you know, you and I are having a chat and we're enjoying ourselves and then, right. Everything is, is just chill. Right. Everything's very, yeah. very chill. I, when I first started riding my youngster, when she was five, I could not imagine the things that I do now on her, you know, on the buckle with my whip tucked under my thigh and the rain took over the top of it while I'm sorting out, you know, her exercise sheet behind us, They're just unimaginable <laughs> things. But that, that relationship of trust, it just takes time to build. And yeah, it's yeah. trust, the horse trusting themselves, us trusting ourselves, and then bringing that level of trust to each other in an honest kind of way to say, okay, can we, can we trust ourselves in each other's presence and therefore build trust between us? And build trust, yeah. So now, you know, uh, one thing I do want to uh, point out because uh, right with COVID, it's a little hard to do body work uh, and, and do training in person. So what are you doing right now as far as, because I know a lot of trainers are thinking about or talking about or trying to get online, uh, you know, what, what are you doing around that? Um, well, actually, here in the UK, we are treating, well, it's not called treating because we're not vets, but we are mm -hmm. doing body work and we are training in person, one-to-one uh, -one or in small groups again. Oh, okay, good. So long good. as it's outside. Everything's done yeah. outside. I'm doing a lot more holding my own horses than I ever used to. Um, <laughs> but I, I've been spending, uh, certainly the first part of lockdown, I spent a lot of time working online, building an online course. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a course that's available through a company called the Equine Academy that have lots of lots of trainers who've built online courses on everything from like connection, softness, driving, herbalism. There's me. There's confidence coaching from my mentor. There's all kinds of things. So I have a course on there, um, which is kind of focused. It's like the foundations for working in hand. I'm a mm -hmm. big, big believer in working a horse in hand. If you can't do it on the floor, why on earth are you trying to do it from their back? basically right you know, right. they need they need to autonomously know that they can move their bodies themselves so the course that i've got up so far is yeah like the the mindset stuff that we've spoken about a lot today preparations mentally for yourself for working in hand and then the beginning of the touch based work to build that relationship with the horse there will be an in hand and a lunge work course as soon as i finish making them basically <laughs> i'm now homeschooling as well so it's taken a little longer um and I teach online. I do uh, like video assessments, but also just talking through. There's so much theory behind writing. When you come at it from a, a personal development point of view, there is so much work you can do. Actually, I think it's almost better. I'm going to encourage my students to meet me online first mm. before I do, you know, because I do clinics around the country and stuff. And eventually, post COVID, around the world, um, to meet and discuss these things first over Zoom. Like, Zoom is such a wonderful thing. What a gift to ourselves. Uh, and then when you actually have your time on the horse with me, we, we don't have to go through all of the personal stuff because you kind of had a chance to deal with it. And then we can just deal with it as it arises with the horse. Yeah. And that, that's, I love that you're doing that, right? Because a lot of times, you know, what happens, you, you go and um, there's no like pre discussion at all about what personally is going on or where you're at, or, you know, there's a theory discussion on, uh, you know, how many times this happened, right? There's a theory discussion on Friday and then everybody's boom, 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 boom. And their lessons on Saturday and Sunday. And so very intimidating, right? Um, in environment. So it, it sounds like the online thing is like kind of, you know, the best of both worlds where you're getting to know each other, you're getting things across and then there's time for that to marinate, right? And then, exactly. then when you're there with, with a horse, right? So, because yeah. You can, you can affect change in yourself all of a sudden, mm -hmm. but only when you're right, ready at the cliff to fly and yeah. it can take us a long time to get up the cliff uh what else have i been doing i've set up a facebook group for my students and my clients because i don't necessarily see them that often because we're all a bit scattered so i've got a nice space for people to ask questions and i love setting people homework um so they can tell me how they're getting on with that i'm just nosy basically i really discovered <laughs> what, what i really discovered during lockdown that i just missed all my people yeah you know yeah. i'm so used to going out and seeing them like every four weeks, every six weeks or, you know, longer. And I just missed knowing how they were doing and how their horses were getting on and how they were progressing with the stuff we'd worked on last time. So yeah, I have a little Facebook community now where we can all 
chat about it, which is nice. Wonderful, which is really, yeah. really nice. Well, says I really want to thank you for being on the show. Uh, and this has been, you know, a great, you know, hour conversation. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I asked my guests, and I'm sure you, you mentioned because you had seen other interviews. So what what is the kind of aha moment in, you know, your work with horses that you would want to share with the audience? Ooh. Now, you see, because you told me there was a question at the end, I purposefully didn't watch any of your other interviews all the way to the end, so I wouldn't know what it was. Oh. So now you can have to just hear the sound of the hamster whirring in my brain. <laughs> the most profound answer I can possibly give you to make me look smart. Um, no, what is the most aha moment? For me, it's been the times where I've actually achieved true presence of mind with a horse. Mm and where they have achieved it as well. And those moments where you float together. And when you know that they're possible, every time that you screw up and it doesn't happen, you're like, yeah, but I know that it can happen. So I'm gonna keep working for it. So what I'd love people to experiment with, I guess, is the combination of kindness to yourself when you're failing and the discipline to keep on showing up in face of the failures. Yeah, yeah, because you will yet. Because the, you will the big get old there. yet, exactly. Yet. <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, says thank you so much. I really appreciate you having on the show. Thank you. Thanks a lot.